I know gave you this amazing presentation of the whole research that you can summarize in just one equation. So it gives you a way to think about, uh, about exchange rates. And I'm going to be pedestrian compared to that. Um, so, but before I, I just go to the data and tell you how to do things, I want to say two things about why we should spend some time on, on exchange rates, right? Um, if you think about it, I think you could make the case that it's the most important price uh, in each country. Think about what is clear clearing uh, both the goods market and important exports, what is clearing the asset markets. When you think about the foreign assets and liabilities, how big they are. Matteo gave you some amazing data this morning already. And the currency markets, if you don't want to think in terms of uh, trade, Think about that just in terms of turnover, if you want. Um, it's, a, it's a huge turnover. You've all seen this number, about $6 trillion a day. Um, that's much, much bigger um, than the equity markets. I can just show you uh, over time. This is not something new. The currency market is 18 times bigger than the equity market. It's not something from la last year. So it's a big thing to understand. And here's the thing. Uh, it's not like we understand everything. Um, I really like the question on the R square during the break because it forces us to realize that um, a big chunk of the exchange rate valuation um, we just don't get, we don't understand. And what we see in this field, uh, we see a lot of uh, puzzling uh, facts, puzzling in the sense of uh, comparing the facts to the models, it's not so easy to make sense of the facts. And so you can see this in a kind of um, a depressing way while well, we don't understand anything. I see it in a very um, positive way. It means that there are a lot of open questions, there are a lot of uh, uh, research opportunities, a lot of things to understand. So we're talking about something that is really, really big where our understanding is, is limited. So that's actually a perfect field to, to be in. Now, I, I need to, to warn you, I only have a limited amount of time and um, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, data, about how to do stuff in, in practice. So there are a lot of things that I'm, I'm not going to talk about that are actually relevant uh, for international finance and exchange in particular. And so I have to apologize. It's going to be a very uh, limited, uh, limited tour. But still, let's go for the tour. So Hanno gave you this uh, overview of the exchange rate determinants, thinking in terms of the link with the short-term interest rates, long-term interest rates, and the, the convenience yields and balance sheet constraints. I'm going to focus on one point, which is how currency returns can be understood, can be thought as um, a sign of aggregate risk, aggregate risk being priced in, in, in the currency markets. And so I'm going to walk you through this um, this reasoning and a lot of research that uh, we've done over the last uh, 15 years. And if you want to think about the, the organization of, the, of this session, I'm going to talk about FX returns with risk. Uh, and then Wang Xin is going to come and she's going to show you FX returns without risk. <laughs> That's, uh, of course, much, much more exciting. But let's start, uh, let's start with the, the, the basics, the FX returns with risk. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the same thing as Hanno did. I'll start from this uh, accounting benchmark, the present value equation, um, going back to, to Campbell Shiver, if you want. The only thing you have to do is to define what is a currency excess return. So just to introduce my notation, look at what I have on the screen. I'm thinking about um, a US investor borrowing at the uh, risk free rate IT. This uh, US investor, he or she is gonna land at the foreign risk free rate I star, and the problem is that there is an exchange rate. So if I borrow for one month and I lend for one month, I know exactly the exchange rate today, but I don't know what it is at the end of the month. And so if the foreign currency appreciates, when my money is there, that's pretty good. My excess return is higher, but if the foreign currency depreciates, that's pretty bad, I'm losing money on, on, on the trade. So if you iterate forward this equation, as I've showed you, you can have this um, present value definition of the exchange rate that depends on future interest rates, and risk premium. And the thing is that for a long time, uh, nobody thought that there was any uh, risk premium in, uh, in currency markets. Um, it was just like, no, I was not part of international econ or international macro. And uh, so it was all about the link between interest rates and exchange rates. Now, something that Matteo uh, um, told you uh, in, during the break, if you try to regress exchange rates on interest rates, you get nothing interest rates explain very, very little of our exchange rate. So we need to look at something else. And so what I'm going to look at uh, was kind of risk premium. Now, 
why nobody really uh, thought about this um, or actually could find much. Um, it, it, it's actually has a super long history. It's, it's not the place, I don't have the time to give you the whole story, but it's a story that actually starts in Boston um, where this guy Douglas um, is the first, at least the first I know, who um, proposed this idea of uh, this uncovered interest rate parity. And at first it looked like pretty, pretty reasonable. I'm going to say it not in, uh, in the terms of 18th century economics, but just as of today, think about it. Let's say the interest rate in the US is 1%. Let's say it's 3% in the UK. Why don't you borrow in the US at one in order to lend at three? It seems like a pretty cool thing to do, right? Um, and you can do it with billions of dollars. So you should all be rich by the end of the afternoon. Um, well, you don't do it because you expect the pound to depreciate. By how much? Well, exactly the interest rate difference. So that if you borrow at one, you lend at three, but you lose uh, 2% on the exchange rate and it's not worth it. And if it's not worth it, you don't do it. And if you don't do it, you can have this interest rate uh, difference uh, that persists. Um, instead, if everybody starts borrowing in the US, the interest rate should go up. If everybody starts uh, lending in the UK, the interest rate there should go down. So if we see interest rate differences that are persistent, um, it must be that people expect the exchange rates to depreciate by this interest rate difference. And so that sounds super cool or relatively reasonable. Um, of course, it's, it's not, but that I'm going to show you uh, in, in a second. It took us, us humankind, something like 250 years to find a way to test um, this idea. And you have to introduce rational expectations. Uh, and then it, uh, it's a first paper, uh, it's, uh, the first one to, to run this regression is Trian, um, working at the Fed, regressing the change in exchange rates on interest rate difference. You do this regression, UIP tells you that the slope coefficient should be one. You can do it the way you want. This regression never gives you one. Uh, the slope um, coefficient is usually negative, the R square is around zero. And somehow the field of international finance has run this regression over and over and over again for um, something like uh, 30 years. And you have more than 300 publications who are um, basically telling you that the slow coefficient is negative. No, so that's not super, um, super enthusiastic. And so what I would like to is make sure that you are never gonna run this regression again. So let me show you the data in a very simple uh, form. If UIP was correct, the change in exchange rates that you would expect would be the interest rate difference. So what would be the actual change in exchange rate? Well, it would be the one that you expect plus some noise. So I took the volatility of uh, exchange rate and I built those fake exchange rate uh, changes that would correspond to the UIP regression. And this is what I'm showing you on this slide. This is the way the world should look like if UIP was a correct description of the world, if Douglas was right, okay? Here, every color is a country, every point is one month, a change on interest rate over one month or an interest rate difference over one month. So that's fake data. That's, not, that's actually a lot of macro models in the 80s and 90s and up to even more recently are based, you know, based on that. And this is not true. Let me show you now the truth. This is the truth. I mean, you can see the difference. This is the theory, this is the truth. So clearly UIP is it's not even a right, Stalling point, it actually makes zero sense. Zero sense. Um, I think we just lost way too much time thinking about that. Um, now the second thing that you can take out of this graph is that uh, there's not much to see, right? If you, if you see any pattern, um, well, don't, don't say it, just trade, right? There, there's nothing, there's no pattern. Uh, and that's about the cross section of the exchange rate if you want. And I, I could make pretty much the same point um, if I were to look at the time series of exchange rates. And that goes back to the, the, the question that was asked dur during the break. Um, the, I'm showing you here the change in exchange rates on, the, on three currencies. And um, the truth is that I don't remember which currencies I picked. I think I picked the pound and maybe the euro versus the US dollar, but I'm not totally sure. And I'm actually absolutely sure that one of them is uh, just me playing with random numbers on MATLAB. And you can't tell me which one is which. And I can't tell you either because it was, I did that too long ago. And the point is that, yeah, it looks random, but it's not random. And so what, what I want to convince you in this short session is that exchange rates are not random, 
And all the reasonings that Hanno showed you before, yes, we can find uh, uh, those in, in, in the data. There is hope. It's not because it's difficult, it's not possible. It's, it, it's, it's there. So how are we gonna do this? Well, um, we need to, in some sense, um, rephrase a little bit the, the question. We are, we are not gonna be really able to predict exchange rates uh, on a daily basis, on monthly basis, very precisely. We're not gonna be able maybe to understand every bilateral exchange rates, but we can still find um, some uh, clear systematic uh, movements in, in exchange rates. So I'm going to uh, show you how to do this. And of course, at some point, I'm going to stop, right, don't worry. Um, I'm going to stop twice. And uh, as Matteo uh, and, and Brent remind us, when I stop and we ask questions, we're not recorded anymore. Okay, so how do we uh, try to see something in the data, um, knowing that those UIP uh, regressions um, didn't give us much? Well, I think the, the way to see something is to realize that UIP is just an assumption about risk neutrality. When you say that the UIP is the way you close your model, you're basically saying that the investors are risk neutral. You're saying that the expected excess return is, is zero. And by the way, you can express this in nominal or in real uh, variables. It's pretty much the, the same because of course you can think about the nominal interest rates as the real plus the expected inflation. And the real exchange rate is also gonna have these two inflation components. So if you look, think about the UIP regression, the fact that we find a slope coefficient beta that is not one, but is actually usually negative, this just means that the expected excess returns is time varying. And the interest rate difference should be one of the drivers of those uh, expected uh, excess return. There's nothing that says it should be the only one, but at least since you've run this regression 300 times, you know that uh, there could be some information in, in interest rates. So, how are we gonna use this information? Well, that's the thing we did, uh, we did with Hanno uh, some time ago now, is to switch from a time series study of the, of the exchange rates currency by currency to a cross-sectional study of exchange rates where we build portfolios of currencies. There's a really cool paper by Hassan and Mano in the QG that shows you exactly uh, how to go from the time series to the cross-sectional evidence. Here, I'm just gonna show you how to do it in, in practice. So once you say you wanna build uh, some currency portfolios, okay, that's all cool. Of course, it's, it's uh, only a new idea only uh, for currencies because people have been building um, portfolios of equity and bond returns uh, for decades, right? Think about the work of Fama and French, they sort stocks according to the book to market, they sort stocks according to the size of the, of the firm and so on. So we can do the same thing for, for currencies. There are many reasons actually not to do it. I'll also discuss that in, in, in a second. So if you want to build currency portfolios, you, you have to deal with the first basic set of questions. And um, I said I was going to be pedestrian, so let me go for it. You need to pick a sample of countries, okay? And you need to pick a time window. Where, where do you stop? Where do you start? Um, how many countries should you have? How many years should you have? There's no theorem here, nothing. I think one way to think about it is uh, to ask um, the following questions. Can foreign investors buy risk-free notes there? And why do I ask you this question? Then think about what Hanu showed you. He started with uh, simple order equations. If you want this order equation to hold, you need the foreign investor to be able to, uh, to buy. So that would be the first thing. Now, as soon as you realize this, you know, ooh, that means I need to think about capital controls just to see if you can already invest there. You need to think about uh, default risk. Uh, that's, these are difficult questions, right? Uh, there's a lot of uh, papers just uh, on measuring those different, uh, different things. So we're gonna need to take a stand on, on that. Okay, let's imagine we've done this and we found a set of countries where we can invest and we find a set of uh, risk-free um, notes, things like treasury bills uh, instruments. Now we're getting into the, the, the ways of thing. How many portfolios are we gonna build? How are we gonna allocate uh, countries uh, into those portfolios? And here it's cool because you can think about um, all this literature on uh, stocks, on the stocks and bond markets. They had to deal with the same uh, issues except that it was much easier for them. There's a simple reason why nobody had done this on currency markets. Think about the number of countries you have. 
if you can find 100 countries to invest in, that's already a big thing, right? I can find 500 firms in less than 30 minutes. Um, and so from the start, from the get-go, it looks like you know, there's, very, there's this very small number of countries you can invest in. And the logic of a, of a portfolio, of course, is to hope that all the idiosyncratic uh, shops are gonna average out in a portfolio. If I can form a portfolio of 50 uh, firms, yeah, maybe the law, law of large numbers is gonna kick in. If I go on and form a portfolio of six countries, is the law of large number gonna kick in? It's not so obvious, right? But it's gonna kick in. I'm gonna show you that in, in a second. But clearly, when we think about the number of portfolios and how to allocate countries or assets into portfolios, that's what we have in mind. We have in mind this trade-off between the idiosyncratic risk being averaged out and the power of any kind of cross-section we want to build. If you have only two points, you can fit a line. If you want some power in any kind of an econometric test, you need many more points. And the points here are going to be the portfolios. So if you have many portfolios, maybe you're going to have some power um, in, when you run your asset pricing test, but of course, you're going to have very few countries in each portfolio. And again, here, there's no fear and, and actually, we could you could use some uh, some more work here on thinking about what is the optimal way to build uh, to build portfolios. There are, there's also things to learn from the work of Andrew Ang, for example, on that. Now, what did we do? Well, at first, uh, I'm going to show you different uh, um, phases of our work, but we started with uh, the largest data set we could build, looking at many many countries, taking into account capital con controls, in default risk, um, and and trying to in some sense build as many portfolios uh, as possible and then i'll show you that like, this was really very difficult and, and there's maybe a much easier way to do this i could just mention a, a tiny detail that we made at some point uh, this um choices that um, i think has been repeated since uh, to have more countries in the last portfolio um, because think about it you you want to buy five you want to build, sorry, five uh, currency portfolios. You have already uh, 20, say 26 countries. You don't have uh, five uh, countries per portfolio. So where do you put the residual number of countries? Well, let's put them in the last one. Why? Why not? Um, it's just, if you hope that uh, this, this is where the information is, you want the um, idiosyncratic uh, risk to average out more there. But this is very uh, fuzzy, of course. Okay. And then there are questions like weighting. How should you weight currencies? How should you weight countries? Uh, if you're influenced by the literature in traditional macro, you're going to think about trade. Um, maybe if you're more um, international finance, you want to think about the international flows, uh, the capital flows. Um, honestly, we didn't know how to think about that. So what I'm going to show you are just equally weighted, uh, equally weighted portfolios. But here, these are open questions, right? So I'll show you first the, the, the first thing we did with Hano when we built this large sample of countries uh, starting in 1953. And for the first time, we built uh, currency excess returns in those portfolios. And so the currency excess returns, just to, to repeat myself here, think about a US investor borrowing at a risk free rate in the US, say a treasury bill, you borrow say for three months, and then you're gonna lend your money, convert those dollars into some foreign currencies, you lend this money for three months in a foreign country. This defines a currency excess returns. The only source of risk here is the change in exchange rates. So if you can study something about this excess return, you know that you're studying something about the currency risk because everything else is, is, is known. Right? And what I'm showing you here in two panels are the average uh, excess return annualized uh, over those two uh, sample um, and then the sharp ratio. And what you can see is that there's a clear pattern. The first portfolio has the low interest rate countries. The last portfolio has the high interest rate countries. And the currency excess returns on average tend to increase from low to high. And so that was the first result. Um, the thing to note here um, is actually it doesn't prove much because it could totally be that exchange rates are still completely random. And the only thing you're picking up here is the interest rate difference. So this result that I'm showing you here could be totally mechanical. In the first portfolio, you put low interest rate countries. In the last portfolio, you put high interest rate countries. Maybe what you have is just the interest rate difference. It turns out it's not the case. And this difference of uh, average excess return can really be thought as just a sign of uh, compensation for risk. So how could it be a compensation for risk? Well, 
clearly in the last portfolio, if I invest there, I make money on average. I borrow in the US, I always invest in the high interest rate currencies. I make money on average. If I make money on average, it must be that I'm taking on some risk. So what, could, what, is, what has to be the risk? It has to be that those high interest rate currencies are gonna depreciate in bad times. I'm the US investor. What is a way to define bad times? Well, you could start with consumption. Um, when consumption growth is low, these are pretty bad times. So are you gonna lose money um, in, in bad times by investing in high interest rate currencies? The answer is yes. You can do some simple uh, OLS uh, regressions um, and you're gonna just show that. I, I, I actually don't need to talk about that too much, but just you should know that the, really the most basic consumption-based asset pricing view of exchange rate, it, it sort of works. I'm not saying that uh, consumption growth is going to explain much, but come on, it sort of, sort of works. And that's already, uh, here you already see a big change compared to um, what we were discussing, for example, during the, the break. Mm -hmm. Matteo mentioned that uh, when you regress exchange rates on consumption growth or any other macro variable, you get nothing. So the unconditional variation between exchange rates and consumption growth is zero. But conditioning on interest rate, it's not zero. So let me say it again. The logic of those asset pricing regressions are very simple. In bad times in the US, US investors are gonna lose money by investing in high interest rate currencies. And it's just the opposite for low interest rate currencies. If you invest in low interest rate currencies, so you borrow in the US and you tend to invest in currencies like Japan, Japanese yen or the Swiss francs, on average, you lose money. Why do you lose money? Because in bad times, you're gonna make money because low interest rate currencies are gonna appreciate. Okay, so the basic, really consumption-based asset pricing is not such a bad uh, starting point, but we can go much, much further than that. And I think the, the, the way um, now that um, a lot of people form currency portfolios and extract information from currency markets is not by looking at the annual frequency and looking at the, um, the relationship with, uh, with consumption growth. It's by looking at um, um, much higher frequency data, and I'm gonna show you the monthly, uh, the monthly data. And instead of trying to think about um, what I mentioned, uh, whether investors can really invest there, um, whether there's some risk, some default risk or not, people now rely on the um, simple forward uh, and, and spot exchange rates that I'm gonna show you in a second. But the logic is still the same. The logic is still that if I just look at one bilateral exchange rate, say the pound versus the US dollar, and I try to link that to anything, I don't see it. I don't see it. It's just there's too much noise if you want. Think about this uh, change in exchange rate as being driven partly by systematic shocks, but also by a lot of idiosyncratic shocks. And that's just too much noise to, uh, to extract uh, anything. So forming currency portfolios is gonna be a way for, to average out in some sense for the uh, idiosyncratic shocks and see something in exchange rates, see, see something, it's not random. So what I'm gonna show you now again is the same experiment where you sort countries on the level of interest rates, but you do it every month. And every month you, have, you get a new sorting, so you can rebalance your portfolio. And you're gonna think about the same object. I'm still talking about only one object, the one that I showed up in a Hanos uh, um, presentation, a currency excess return. I borrow in the US, I invest in a foreign country for one month. The only source of risk is a change in exchange rate over this month. Okay? Now here's the good news. Everything I'm gonna show you now, you have it. You have it and you have both the data and the MATLAB programs. Right? So let me explain uh, what, uh, what we are sharing today. So we're gonna define the uh, currency excess returns using a forward rate. So Wang Xin is gonna talk to you about forward rate um, much better than I could. So let me just remind you what a forward contract is, right? I sign a contract today that says that I will be able to exchange some foreign currency for some dollars at the end of the month. So I sign today, but nothing happens today. Everything is gonna happen at the end of the month. So that's also a way to think about a, a currency investment. Sign this contract, don't do anything, wait until the end of the month. In the end of the month, you're gonna receive some foreign currency. You need to convert this into dollars at the end of the month, but you don't know what's gonna be the exchange rate at the end of the month. Wait and see what's gonna be your return, the difference between the forward rate that you signed today and the spot exchange rate that's gonna happen at the end of the month. And that's the first equation I have here on this slide. Now, you know that you can rewrite this equation by just uh, subtracting the spot exchange rate today and adding it up. And what you see is that you have this um, forward spot difference minus the change in exchange rates. 
So if corporate interest rate parity holds, and that's what Wenxin is going to talk about, you have another way to just compute a currency excess returns. And there's no magic here. There's still only one source of risk, which is the value of the exchange rates at the end of the month. So why would you do some? What would you do? Would you do something like this? Well, it actually addresses a lot of the questions. Uh, that we had to deal with uh, before. Can you really invest in this country or not? You don't care about this anymore. You can buy this forward contract. Some forward contracts are called deliverable versus non-deliverable. You can even ignore that. Is there someone somewhere willing to sign this forward contract with you? That's it. That's all you want to know. Um, and then you're going to define the exchange rate, very, the, sorry, the currency access return very easily. The nice thing you're going to be able to do now too is to take into account the transaction cost uh, that were actually much more difficult to compute, uh, compute before. Now, there are some advantages, there must be some, some disadvantages too. Um, you're going to have a much more limited sample. So if you're already worried that um, we can, we, we look um, strange compared to uh, the equity uh, literature because we have only a few countries, you can even fewer countries here because it's not the case that forward contracts exist on every country. And the second, of course, uh, issue now is that the CIP doesn't hold uh, after the financial crisis. So that's a, a very nice point that Hanno Hano made it. Now, because the CIP doesn't hold, it turns out that actually the currency excess returns the carry that I'm, trade that I'm going to describe is even more profitable on forward markets than on cash markets. Um, but more on that later, when Xing will talk about that. So let me just explain what, uh, what we posted and what we're sharing uh, today. We're sharing data requests that actually pull data from data stream from two uh, big uh, suppliers, Barclays, because that's the way to start in 1983, and Reuters, because that's actually the largest uh, um, set and kind of the, the benchmark, starting in 1988. And we have the spot in the forward uh, series uh, updated to um, last week at the daily frequency. So from that, we have code and we're showing you code to build uh, data set, just importing those data, cleaning up a little bit because as any, any data source, there are some strange values from time to time. So we have this cleaning procedure where you can just uh, read the MATLAB code. And same thing for equity returns. So large set of countries, all the MSCI equity returns and a bunch of interest rates. And with this uh, raw material, the code is going to do what I just described before. It's going to import all that and build those currency portfolios, compute the currency excess returns from the perspective of US investors, and run a bunch of simple asset pricing experiments. Okay. So all that, um, and Matteo and Stacy organize everything. It's on a web page. You're going to find everything. So what I'm going to show you is basically the results, but you're going to be able, of course, to run it yourself. And I hope it's going to be, it's going to help you uh, do much more, of course, than what I'm just uh, showing you uh, today. Okay. So what am I showing you here? I'm showing you uh, the portfolios of excess returns, the way we. Um, uh, found them the first time with uh, Hanno and Nick um, in this uh, RFS paper. And the first, uh, is, uh, the first panel is just the average excess return. So you see the same message again. The first portfolio has low interest rate currencies. The last portfolio has high interest rate currencies. What you see is a clear cross-section of currency excess returns from negative in the first portfolio to positive in the last portfolio, from minus 1.5 to 7.7. So again, this could just be interest rates, but no, it's much more than that. It's about what's going on uh, with uh, exchange rates. And so there are two ways to show you that those excess returns are compensation for risk, and thus risk premia are there, exist in currency markets. The first way to do it is in panel two. Think about, uh, you remember Fama in French? They, they sort uh, firms on the basis of their book to market, on the basis of their size. They obtain, again, exactly as we are uh, showing you here, a cross section of, current, of um, an equity excess return, but uh, not currency in their, in their cases. And what do they do next? Next, they want to show that um, those excess returns co correspond to a covariances between the returns and some risk factors. But they don't know what the risk factors are. So they use the returns themselves to build the risk factor. So Fama and French look at the high book to market 
uh, the return on high book to market firms minus the return on low book to market firms and they say this is HML. They look at the return on small firms minus the return on big, big firms and they say this is SMB. That's going to be a proxy for, for risk in, in, in equity markets. We're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to look at the return on the last portfolio minus the return on the first portfolio. And then we're going to call it HML, just as they did. Okay, high minus low, high interest rate currencies minus low interest rate currencies. And what you can do, so you can run a simple OLS regression of the currency excess returns or even the exchange rate component if you want on this HML factor. And what you see is in panel two is our clear differences in betas from low to high betas. That's already a sign of a, of a risk premium. Right? You, can, you can explain an average excess return as a covariance between the return and the risk factor. But you may say, well, that's just still explaining returns with returns. Um, and there's not much uh, of a distance between your proxy for, for risk and what you're trying to explain. So let me show you um, what I think is actually even more convincing experiment. Let's build now um, a risk factor without using any exchange rates. So what, the way we're going to do this, we're just going to look at the volatility on, uh, on equity markets with this idea that uh, when volatility is, is high, maybe you can talk about uncertainty. Um, when volatility is high, these are pretty bad times. But uh, we want to build a risk factor based on volatility without using exchange rates. So look at the equity returns in many different uh, countries. The same countries actually uh, is in a sample for exchange rates. But you measure the equity returns in local currency. Right? No exchange rates. You compute the realized volatility, take the average of all the countries. Now you want to talk about sharks, so let's look at the change in, uh, in volatilities. And let's do the same experiment again. Let's see in a simple OLS regression, what is the beta of each portfolio return on this measure of aggregate volatility. And that's what you see in panel three. From 0 0.19 to minus 0 0.42. So what does one's um, uh, number mean? <laughs> it means that uh, there's a very different amount of risk in the first portfolio and the last one. And in between, you have this cross-section. So let me explain the sign. The sign is exactly what you would expect. In times when volatility spikes, shoots up, these are really bad times. You're going to lose money by investing in high interest rate currencies. And why are you going to lose money? Because those high interest rate currencies are going to depreciate. But what's going to happen with the low interest rate currencies? Exactly the opposite. You're going to make money if you're invested in low interest rate currencies because those currencies are going to appreciate. And again, the measure of bad times here are just spikes uh, in, in global volatility. Not something that uses any exchange rate. It's just a measure of risk. It's not uh, maybe the classic ones. You know, maybe the first one we, should, we could have tried, but others have tried um, uh, some that could work too. Um, Matteo, for example, has shown that um, measures of downside risk on equity markets do a pretty good job also of explaining the same, the same currency portfolio. Right? But here, what I want to show you is that we can use the simple um, logic of an order equation. You make money on average by investing in a risky asset. Why? Because you're going to lose money in bad times. This simple logic applies to the currency markets. Exchange rates are not random. It's something I'm going to repeat many times. So here I'm showing you the classic uh, uh, 45 uh, degree nine asset pricing graph. On the vertical axis, I have the actual mean excess return, the exact same uh, data I just showed uh, you. And on the horizontal uh, axis, I have the predicted mean excess return, which is again a, a product of a quantity of risk, a beta times a price of risk that we can estimate. And you can even just take the average um, excess return when you use HML and it works pretty well. Like it's not perfect, there are some pricing errors, but it works, there is, some, there is a clear thing. Uh, if things were random, you would not see something like this. And you have the same, uh, same result on a larger sample of uh, developed and emerging countries. Again, you have now all the data to redo this graph. And of course, not just do that, that will be boring, but use the same methodology to find more. Okay. Now, instead of doing an asset pricing graph, I found actually um, much more convincing, a very simple experiment. Okay. You look at the average currency excess return again from low interest rate currency in the first portfolio to high interest rate currency in the last one. This is what you get on average. It only makes sense if you lose money in bad times. If 
you want to understand why in portfolio number five you make money on average, it only makes sense that you need to lose money in bad times. Well, you can just check that. Just look at what happens when you invest in those, uh, those countries in times of high global volatility. Here I'm looking at two standard deviation above, a, a big shark, right? And what you see is that you're going to lose a lot of money in, when, when volatility spikes up. And the difference with the first portfolio, in the first portfolio, you're going to make money in these exact uh, same bad times. So that's really the, 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 the risk return trade-off. That's the basic thing we teach to all students and the graduate MBAs and PhDs, right? It's just inaction. You make money on average on the last portfolio because you lose money in bad times. On the first portfolio, you lose money on average. Why? Because it's an insurance contract. In bad times, you're going to make money. That's really the, the logic. Okay. You can see the same thing on a, on a larger sample of both the developed and emerging countries. Okay. The risk return trade-off in action, really finance 101 if you want. Okay. So this I think now seems relatively uh, simple and uncontroversial. Uh, of course, it just ask, it raises many questions. I'm gonna go there in, in a second. Um, but when we started, it was kind of um, surprising. And so I remember the first paper with Hanno where our data sets uh, ended in, uh, in, in 2002. And so this in some sense for us is uh, out of sample. And for a while, you know, explaining this risk, uh, risk story, it was a bit difficult because people were making a lot of money on the carry trade, the simple investment strategy where you you go short the first portfolio and you go long the last one. That's what I'm showing you here on, the, on this blue, uh, blue line. These are community returns. When you start with $100 in 2002 and how much money you make over time. And at first, yeah, people were making a lot of money in the carry trade and that's maybe the only thing they uh, remembered from our work. Um, but then the crisis happened and, uh, and they lost everything. And they lost everything exactly at the same time that the equity um, volatility spiked. And here I'm using really the same measure of uh, equity volatility I told you about, no exchange rate data. And that's, yeah, that's the way it should be. It's like, this is not, um, this is not surprising in some sense. It, we don't know when the next crisis happens, but we should expect that in the next crisis, uh, people lose money on risky investments, right? And so guess what? Um, so that's something that we discussed recently with Hanno. It's, it's, it's amusing. I mean, amusing, sad for some people, but it's amusing if you're a researcher, just to look at what happened um, on the currency markets um, in, the, um, in this year. We had a spike in uh, volatility on all equity markets, a huge amount of uncertainty um, in March, in April, and look at what happened on the carry trade. People lost a lot of money. Now, there were also some smart people who actually saw it coming and made a lot of money by just uh, taking the opposite position. But now, if you're just going for the carry trade, you're going to make money on average because you're going to lose money in bad times. And that's the logic. Okay. Now, one last, um, one last graph before, before I stop. I, I pause, not stop. Um, I want to show you now what uh, Hanno um, told you about this, this morning. This idea that we can look not just at the link between exchange rates and short-term interest rates, but also the link between exchange rates and long-term interest rates. So this is one graph that summarizes a paper uh, with Hanno and Andreas, where we look at um, carry trade returns, thinking about the same uh, holding period. So you, you borrow for one, for one quarter, you lend your money for one quarter, but you can um, go long and short treasury bills. That's what the first point you're gonna see here on the left-hand side of this graph. And if you just um, play with uh, G10 countries, on average, you're gonna make something like a 3.5% return. And since the standard deviation is around, uh, is around 10, the short ratio is pretty good. But you can think about the same investment strategies where instead of playing with treasury bill, you can play with long-term bonds. And what I'm showing you on this graph is what happened to the average excess return when you keep the same investment period. So we are still talking about three months, but instead of going short and long treasury bills, we are increasing progressively the maturity of the bonds that we are playing with. So in the end, on the right-hand side of the graph, we are playing um, with long-term long -term bonds, uh, in this case, in this, in this case uh, 16, 15 years. And so, what you clearly see is that something is going on. A strategy that was clearly profitable with treasury bill is no longer profitable with long-term bonds. So what's going on? What's going on is exactly what Hanno showed you this morning. 
when you start playing with long-term bonds, you introduce an additional source of risk. It's interest rate risk. And it turns out that this, the compensation for this interest rate risk, what we call the term premium, moves in the opposite direction to the current series premium. So when you go long and short long-term bonds, you're taking, in foreign countries, you're taking on some currency risk, but also some interest rate risk. And they move in the opposite direction. They tend to cancel out each other. So there are interesting things that are going on here on the interaction between risk premium. So the first part uh, of my presentation was to show you that risk premium are there on currency markets. And here, trying to tell you that, you know what? Yeah, they are there, but they are complicated objects and they interact with other sources of, um, of uh, risk premium. Okay, so that's going to be there. I, I, wanna, uh, I, I wanna stop uh, very soon, but just to take stock, what was the point of this uh, first part of the presentation? Well, just to tell you that the risk premium are there. We have a clear uh, driver of exchange rates at the point that uh, Matteo made. Exchange rates are not random, but as soon as you, you go there, it actually um, it, it, it means that there are a lot of um, other questions that we should uh, think about, okay? So I have, after that, uh, a series of um, certain suggestions, ideas of uh, things that could be done. But before I can tell you what I'm going to do, I need to tell you in some ways what, uh, what people have done over the last uh, 10 years. Um, a lot of people have looked at um, other sources of, um, of, uh, of risk and whether they are priced or not in, in, in currency markets. So on this slide here, you have just a, a bunch of examples. And if you think about what, how you could contribute to this literature, of course you could go for more. It's, it has to be that we haven't found uh, out yet all the, the sources of uh, aggregate risk in, in currency markets. You could look for more. I think the thing that is at least as exciting and even more maybe is to find the reason for why those risk premia exist, right? And where are the frictions? Uh, are they in the goods market, in the asset trading? We don't really know. And some people have some ideas and there are some really cool contributions. I'm gonna go over there in a second. But there are a lot of opportunities. You can think of this as just um, a first uh, small step in one direction, saying that exchange rates are not random. We can study exchange rates. There is something to understand there. It doesn't mean that we understood everything. Okay. So maybe let me pause it here.